so hi, I'm Jeff Ninakawa, and I'm a professor in the English department, and I'm going to read a little bit from a book that I'm writing now um, uh, about basically my, my dorky parents and what it was like to be raised at a certain moment historically um, and, and uh, with certain kinds of values, certain kinds of, you know, boring values, kind of boring middle road, middle sort of middle of the everything values, middle class, middle brow, uh, sort of moderate liberal Democrats, like how it felt to be raised by that, as it were, formation, to use a fancy academic phrase. First of all, beginning of the book, I can't tell you much about them. My mother would kill me if I did, even if she had to come back from the dead to do so. And I doubt very much that I'd write anything at all about our dad if he were still alive. The thought of what he would have to say to me almost stops him on the tracks even now. It's almost, sorry, Dan. Our mom has given me permission to write about her as long as, quote, is in halfway decent taste, and I don't tell you too much. If you're wondering what too much is, <laughs> well, I guess it's like what the Supreme Court Justice said about obscenity. You know it when you see it. My mom sure will. I'm going to skip now to our parents in love. Well, the book is partly premised, I should tell everybody, partly premised on a moment in my parents' lives. They, don't, they didn't identify this as a big deal, but it was. My father was Japanese. My mother is very Caucasian, like very, very kind of like past the potato salad ma. Caucasian. So they met at Washington State University in 1949 or 1950, way long ago, way long ago, which prompts my brother and his kids to say, of course, you know a lot of history, Ma, Grandma. You lived through most of it, because that's how kids think now. But they met at Pullman, Washington in 1950. It's hard to think of our parents in love. Partly that's because it feels like prying, and partly that's because no one wants to think about their parents in love. Uh, at least no one I know, at least not for very long. As long as you're being safe, I don't care to know the details, our mother said to me once when I seemed poised to tell her more than she wanted to know about my personal life sometime back in the late 80s. And the same goes, goes double when the shoe was on the other foot. And besides, by the time we came along, our parents didn't seem very interested in the subject themselves. Our mom would tell stories sometimes about how roman a romantic our father could be when they were first together and how he wrote love letters to her when they were first apart, but we never exactly believed her. Sometimes he'd praise her when she wasn't around, back her up when she wasn't, um, and on the right day, show how much he enjoyed her company. But romantic letters and gestures were not part of any father we could ever see. It probably went out on their anniversary, though I can't remember for sure. I can tell you uh, uh, for sure that they both considered Valentine's Day a conspiracy cooked up by the greeting card companies, candy makers, and FTD. And I wouldn't be surprised if they took a similarly dim view of most anniversaries. While it's hard to imagine our mom and dad acting like characters out of a romantic comedy, it was easy to believe her story about their first date, which sounded like classic dad. His roommate was dating her roommate, and one Saturday night when the three of them were sitting down to a game of cards, our dad asked if her roommate wouldn't, wanted to ask our mom to play too, thus avoiding the hazard of ejection. The game was hearts, which our mother hadn't played before, but it was easy enough to learn. Two or three dates later, she knew she was in trouble. Our mother always said that it was the only time she was ever in love. Oh, sure, she dated her share of boys in high school and even got steady with a few. But with her father, it was something different. She'd never met anyone like our father, someone you could talk to about anything, no matter how personal or the opposite of personal, principles and politics. Before she met him, she didn't know you could talk about some of those things at all. He had some ideas she found a bit far out and friends with ideas further out still but when it came to the basics, they saw eye to eye. They met in the middle of the Korean War, which they both called necessary. It was the last time either one of them would say that about a, about a US war, except the war on poverty, which even though it wasn't really a war, was one they really supported. Neither one of them were pro-communist, but they weren't exactly anti-communist either. Not the kind who were finding them under every bed and using the fear of them to deny free speech and make people suspect their neighbors. Still though, they weren't soft on communism. They'd grown up too hard to be soft on anything, except sometimes each other, people that had it hardest, harder than they'd had it, and later sometimes. For our mother, that growing up hard was called the Great Depression. The Great Depression installed in the souls of mothers like ours at least one commandment and one article of faith. The commandment was, to save as much as you could for some future beyond anything you could easily define. You could say the spirit of saving 
was passed down by our ancestors even before the Great Depression, some Protestant ethic that got started somewhere in Europe, carried west. Of course, you wouldn't uh, want to go too far down that road since uh, many of your non-Protestant moms had the same spirit conveyed by different tongues and accents. Never buy retail. Never buy retail, as they used to say on the Lower East Side and in Chinatown, however they said it in Chinese. Protestant or not, for most of the moms we knew, saving money was next to godliness, though our mom would never say so in so many words. Our mother never talked about God, God or godliness, except as some vague speculation or sharp remark about your holier than thou types who claimed to know for a fact that the biggest backer was on their side. She, although she wouldn't flat out say as much, I can tell you our mother considered saving money as a form of salvation that goes even beyond saving yourself and your loved ones at the poorhouse where we'd wind up if she let our spendthrift father have his way. One of the few solid signs I've ever seen of our mother's flickering belief in an afterlife has appeared like so much else about her in the bright lights of the supermarket. As sure as she is of the virtue of buying what's on sale, I'm sure that she secretly believes that saving money is a way of saving yourself from death or at least getting it discounted. Back when moms like ours smoked, they bought their cigarettes by the carton. That, this, that was the only way to do it. They were cheaper that way. They don't smoke much anymore, those bombs who are left, either because they stopped in time or because in time the smoking stopped them. Those who quit went straight from buying them by the carton to not buying them at all. Nowadays, you'll find the survivors trolling the aisles at Costco, trying to calculate which of the bulk items on sale they'll be able to use before their respective expiration dates secretly believing that their own will be extended so long as they've got perfectly good blocks of cheese, just cut off the mold, or survivalist sized stores of AAA batteries that someone has to move up, even if it takes all eternity. So now we're gonna go back to the second great fact of this Great Depression that stayed with our mom was over the legend of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Growing up, our mother had never known another president until he died when she was 14. The ones who came after were more or less okay, until Nixon anyway, but they weren't in the same league. They were barely even the same species. But if FDR was larger than life, he was also part of it. For our mother, the Great Depression and her own mother's death were two halves of the same hard time. Between her father and her brothers and FDR, coming to them over the radio, everyone did their part to make life in hard times possible, and that included her. Joycey may have had her own ways, as everyone said about her. That didn't mean she didn't have her own chores, slopping the pigs, setting the table. Everyone had their work cut out for them. And that included their only daughter and FDR. Our mother couldn't remember how much she or the other members of the family knew about FDR's legs. The radio was all he needed to come in loud and clear where she was. So skip now to my father. Uh, and just a couple things about my father. My father had a different relation to the depression. As our mom said, it didn't make it wasn't as big a deal in his house because things were so bad to begin with, it, didn't, it wasn't gonna get that much worse, right? That just wasn't there. Moreover, my father, unlike my mom, had no what we used to call aloha for FDR. Unlike our mother, our father had no love for FDR. When he spoke of him, which wasn't often, it was usually some pointed observation about how he allowed the internment camps and next, did next to nothing for your blacks and your Jews. Most of the time, he waited till our mom wasn't around to criticize FDR. Like a lot of your great societies, our parents' marriage could only last so long, maybe a little longer, depending on the lives of their kids. And even when their coalition was at its strongest, it still had its stresses. Right. Sometimes our dad would go after our mother's beloved FDR as a way of going after her. I'm sorry to tell you that our father would often hold our mother responsible for all the sins of the white race, and sorrier still that their kids would sometimes follow suit. Behind a few bitter comments, though, our father just basically just didn't show much interest in FDR. I'm pretty sure that that's because he was dead certain that FDR wasn't interested in him. Our father had his political fascinations, and FDR was not one of them. He would talk about LBJ's legislative nerve and prowess like he was one of your great generals, Hannibal or Sherman or Kamehameha the Great. The ruthlessness was the heart of the charm. And speaking of charm, no one, not even our mother, was more susceptible to JFK's charms than our dad, 
but charm only got you so far, he would always say. LBJ was a lot less charming than LBJFK and got a lot more done. Look how he used the assassination to pass the civil rights bills that JFK himself could, uh, couldn't when he was alive. And that was dad all over. The body wasn't cold in the grave and he was doing all that. My father loved it. That was our father's idea of pure because impure political genius and about as close as you were, as you were going to get to a resurrection in the fallen real world. But when it came to FDR and Harry Truman, our father was conspicuously cool. His occasional bitter comments were enough to let us know that our parents' united front was based on a compromise, keeping your mouth a little shut sometimes for the sake of the coalition, like FDR's own, I guess. I never wondered why our father was so hard on our mother's beloved FDR. The only thing I wondered was why he wasn't harder on him. Maybe it's because though he'd felt forgotten, he'd, he could see how other forgotten people felt remembered by Roosevelt. Maybe he hoped that they'd turn around and remember people like him. Skipping now, everybody, calendar pages, calendar pages to 1972, 1972, and I'm almost done. My dad and George McGovern. Along with most his friends, our dad thought that the Democratic Party made a colossal mistake nominating George McGovern for president in 1972, though he admired him personally. Just as Bob Dole, the Republican leader who was McGovern's congressional colleague and a fellow Midwesterner famously did, quote, people said he was some kind of radical. He was a gentleman, Dole said about him in his last speech on the Senate floor, like Dole, McGovern had fought in World War II. He was a bomber pilot. And to my father, that meant he was a man of steady nerves, the kind of man you'd want as your commander in chief. Despite his esteem for his character though, our, our father took a dim view of the candidacy. Like a lot of pragmatic types, he thought the party should have gone back to Hubert after Ed Muskie was caught crying in New Hampshire. Hubert Humphrey, its candidate in 68, a one-time progressive, tarnished by his association with the power merchants attached to the Democratic brand, but who, for that very reason, could win elections and get things done. The party establishment, in what, might, in what you might call a fit of self-fulfilling pessimism, clearly agreed with our father. Once McGovern got the nomination by means of new rules that pretty much took the selection process out of their hands, they pretty much stayed at home and sat on them. I didn't, though. I caught the bus down to the ramshackle McGovern headquarters near the university and volunteered. Like our dad, I cared about politics, though more for the glamour of feeling part of some glorious cause with lots of cheering crowds like the ones you see on TV than for any practical reform I could put my finger on and figure out policies, programs, and whatever else it was that required patience. Our father had no patience for such lack of homework and love of the limelight but he made an exception for me in this case. In his heart of hearts, I don't think our father ever really believed that McGovern had a snowball's chance in hell. Though he hailed from middle America, McGovern was part and parcel of the progressive edge of the party. He'd be called a socialist today, as sure as you can say Bernie Sanders or AOC. And by the time he got the nomination, his supporters and his detractors alike had managed to identify him, not just with the liberal, but the lunatic fringe. Acid, abortion, and amnesty was the phrase that his opponents pinned to McGovern and it stuck like a tail in a donkey. No one who was really paying attention could have been very surprised that McGovern lost every state that year to Richard Nixon, except of course for Massachusetts. But our father didn't want me to give up hope. And I guess part of him didn't want to give up hope either. So despite every indication of an epic defeat, he maintained a position of absolute confidence in a McGovern victory. There was nothing unusual about that. Absolute confidence was pretty much our father's go-to posture on all matters, private and public. Ask either one of his wives. I, on the other hand, was very nervous about the signs, about all the signs predicting a world historical rout. And there was nothing unusual about that either. Nervousness about the sky falling was, and is, pretty much my go-to position. I was what Lyndon Johnson would have called a nervous Nelly. Our father was always annoyed by the evidence of this side of me. He never liked to see signs of my weakness and the fact that he had to see so many just irritated him all the more. 
gasp, he'd say, swatting down the late, latest doomsday data I would draw to his attention, the way he'd swat down flies. He hated flies with a violence that could destroy a dinner table. And on more than one occasion, he did. How many times do I have to tell you? McGovern is going to win. He's going to win for a very simple reason. There are more have-nots in this country than there are haves. I don't understand why this is so difficult for you to comprehend. It's very simple math, even for you. He maintained this position until the last precinct was heard from. Come to think of it, I don't remember ever hearing him giving up. Even now, all these administrations later, I can still hear our father's younger self demanding a recount and declaring that those without will someday find their voice and someday that voice will be heard. Our parents don't die, they just fade away. Our parents were never less interesting than when they urged us to work within the system. It was their standard prescription when the rebel types around them, their students, their younger friends, and eventually their own kids were inclined to burn it down and start all over again. And the reform versus revolution debate, as in any other debate, our parents opted for the boring alternative, especially if it involved work, people showing up to their jobs when they were supposed to, the way our mom did to her shifts at the dining hall in college, the way she met her father. It's like what my best friend's mother said to us on our way to hear Crosby, Stills and Nash. This is before uh, Neil Young had joined the band. If anyone offers you marijuana, you turn to them and you say, no thanks, I pass. And that's what she said. Oh my God. Our mom and dad weren't quite so out of touch. While I can't imagine that they ever smoked marijuana, they may well have been close enough to smell it when some younger colleague or cousin did. They wouldn't have gotten up and left the room the way the old school actor Melvin Douglas did whenever Richard Nixon's name was mentioned. His wife, Helen Gahagan Douglas, had been the target of one of Nixon's early smear campaigns. Breaking the rules of playing fair and telling the truth, he slung mud all over her reputation as he slid into the Senate. And they certainly wouldn't have tried to make a citizen's arrest the way that one of their law and order friends tried to do when she saw some kids smoking a joint behind the shopping center. Thinking about that, even now I cringe for her kid who happened to be with her at the time. How embarrassing. Still, breaking the law was breaking the law, as Margaret Thatcher said, and our parents repeated, or was it the other way around? And unless you were somehow married to Martin Luther King or covered by some other princely precedent of civil disobedience, that's just something you didn't do. I don't think our parents ever heard Crosby, Stills, and Nash. If they did, though, they wouldn't have had a whole lot of use for them. And here I quote the lines from the song Chicago. Rules and regulations, who needs them? Open up the door. Are you kidding? Rules and regulations are the basis of civilization, not to mention clean living, clean fluoridated water, voting rights, and every other part of the very air we breathe as citizens of a working democratic system. I don't remember our parents being in the room when I watched Nixon resign. It's odd that I don't, since I remember their being there whenever something happened important enough to interrupt the regularly scheduled programming. I remember one or both of them being in the room when Humphrey Bogart announced he was joining the Free French, when Hubert Humphrey announced he was leaving public life, and virtually every other broadcast event in between. Of course they were there. How else could I have known it? How it was a big deal? They were at home though when Nixon resigned. We would have been all been watching together since there was only one TV in the house. Maybe I was just so involved in the somber spectacle of no man being above the law, I just didn't notice them. Maybe having done their job, they were resigned to realizing that I didn't have to. So this is, a, a, a reading, obviously, from a book that I've been writing for a long time now, in some ways, all of my life, in which, weirdly, in which I will hope to be done, uh, in fact, I, 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 I'm fairly confident that it'll be done within the next, say, six months or so, not in time for the election, but close enough. And it's a book, again, about what it was like to be raised by kind of, by parents, old-fashioned, kind of moderate, bland parents who, who actually, I think, lack the imagination to abandon their principles. They believe the same things they always believe. My mother's, I mean, somebody asked me recently, did your mother make a voting plan? I said, in 1940, my mother made a voting plan. That's, that's the world I'm talking about. I'm trying to, re, to bring it back uh, to kind of uh, recall what that felt like, how, how liberalism felt, how liberalism felt growing up with it. So that's my book. Um, maybe it's called Parents Book. There's one of the suggestions I had for it. Good enough liberals. I have lots of ideas for titles.
Uh, but anyway, that's what the book's about. Thanks. I'm going to show you this one. This is me. I think I showed you this one with Wayne Morris when I was a little kid. My mother took me to this when I was in 1968 in Oregon. So that's Senator Wayne Morris of Oregon who ran, it was a tragic uh, re-election fight that he lost against Bob Packwood. Little Jeff right there. 